Well, it's officially January 1st, 2024, but before I say goodbye to 23, I thought it'd be a fun little idea to put together a compilation of my five favorite videos from this past year. Now, these videos won't be based off of likes or views or anything like that, but just purely off of if I enjoyed making them, if I learned something new or got to experience something different. Now, before I get started, I just want to say thank y'all because 2023 was by far the best year I've ever had on the channel and, and actually my work as well. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without y'all. And I know it's a little cheesy to say, but the support y'all have shown me throughout the year has been amazing, uh, undeserving, and I'm just very grateful for it. So before I do anything else, I just want to say thank y'all. And it also makes me really excited to see what 2024 has in store for us because this little community that we've built has been such a awesome lesson for me, uh, you know, with my work with the way I go about things and approach things, um, with video creation and all that kind of stuff. I've just learned so much throughout this year and it's all because of y'all. I know it sounds cheesy, and, but I, I genuinely do mean that. Uh, again, thank y'all. So with all that said, here are my five favorite videos from 2023 and I hope y'all have a wonderful new year. All right, so I got this thing in the shop and I'm not sure what I was thinking. Believing I could lift this thing on my own. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is get the faceplate on there and then see if I can recruit one of my neighbors to help me at least get it up on the lathe. Yeah, I, I don't know how much this thing weighs to be completely honest with you. I'd be curious to know, but it's full of water, it's soaking wet, who knows, anyways. Let's get the faceplate on and let's get this thing turned. Hopefully. trim it up a little bit with the chainsaw but that's gonna be fun. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you sir. Have a good one. Be careful. I will. I'm gonna try. <laughs> be really careful. Yeah. I'm gonna get the uh, let's see. All right. Uh, thank God for good neighbors. <laughs> but we got it on here. 
and it is uh, it's something. Uh, I have about half an inch of clearance down here, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so now I know I can max this tailstock out at about 28 inches, a little less. But what I'm gonna do is get the chainsaw, clear off some of these corners, so it makes life a little bit easier, and uh, get the tailstock on here, and let's see what happens. So I turned it on and the tailstock here uh, started wobbling a little too more than what I was comfortable with. So I added this little leg that's this wedge in here. It's got a little slot for the, uh, the thickness of the wall here. Let's just see if it adds some stability and uh, hope for the best. <laughs> So I am about done with the outside. Still got a little bit to go, uh, about four or five inches, and then I'll have to clean it up. However, there is this inclusion here where the, uh, the limbs met, so I'm kind of nervous about that. I mean, it runs pretty deep, and it runs close to the bottom here, but I'm hoping I can not necessarily turn it out, but uh, this might be more of an artistic piece with the uh, split here, but we'll see. I may at least get the outside done or, you know, completely shaped before I start concerned or being concerned about it. So let's get the lathe back on. And uh, surprisingly, everything is going very well. Everything's been turning really nicely. Uh, it's been pretty stable. The only issue that I'm having is the size of my tool rest, which I had that the last time that I turned a large bowl. And for some reason, I didn't think about that. And also my bowl gouge is about to the end of its life, at least as lengthwise. So I've still uh, got a few little things I'm a little nervous about, but we'll see, we'll get through it. All right, so I'm gonna get the lathe back on and get back to turning.
right, so I finally got the outside rounded out. It took me a lot longer than I anticipated because I wanted to get rid of this bark inclusion as much as I possibly could. And I've still got a little bit I want to get rid of, so I'll keep working at that. And also, I did run into a little bit of issue. There's a hairline crack running through here. And I'm hoping that doesn't run too deep, but we will see. Also, the curved tool rest was a godsend. It really did help out. Okay, so let me get the tenon started on this and finish up the outside, and I can finally get it flipped around. Got a little bit of an issue again. I was turning the tenon for this and then this all broke loose. Not sure how deep it goes, but it's filled with dirt and bark. And I don't necessarily know if I feel safe turning a bowl this big, especially with a other hairline crack right here and this. So I don't think this bowl is going to turn out as big as I hoped. It already isn't. Uh, I've had to turn away a lot. I'm gonna keep working, keep turning away. Just see if I can thicken that up, like the wall thickness here to where it's not so small, and just see what happens. Either way, this bowl will be finished. Uh, just It's not going to be as big as I wanted it to be. But let's get the lathe back on and finish it up.
right, so I just finished this gigantic elm bowl, and I have to say I am super happy with how this piece finished. Now, the whole idea behind why I wanted to turn something this large was, for one, I just love turning large bowls. It's one of the main reasons why I got into wood turning. But second, and probably more importantly, I just wanted to see what my lathe can handle. Now, I have the Laguna 1836, and it has a one and a half horsepower motor with a 110 voltage. But with that bowl extension, I wanted to see just how far I could push it. And I have to say, I'm highly impressed. It, when I was turning the piece and roughing it out, it actually, I don't believe it bogged down a single time, which was my main concern. And it also was pretty stable throughout the whole piece, which is another big concern. So overall, I would highly recommend the bowl extension if you want to turn larger pieces like this. And it will even work on the smaller one and a half horsepower version. Now, when I started roughing out this piece, it started around 28 inches diameter and about 8 to 10 inches tall. Final piece came in around 23 and a half by 6 inches tall. So I had to turn away a lot there just because there was more voids and inclusion, mark inclusions and that type of stuff that I didn't anticipate, but that's all right. I still was very happy with how this piece. Some of the bigger gaps I ended up having to use black epoxy to fill in. And I'm not really an epoxy guy, but I do use it occasionally to fix things like this because I definitely wasn't going to let this piece go to waste. Now, I wanted to also try and break my record for the biggest bowl I've ever turned, which is actually 24 inches. And so this piece came right in under that, and that's all right. I, I fully expected this piece to be the bigger one, but it is what it is at the end of the day. Uh, so I do have plans already to try and beat the record again, and I will be doing that within the next few weeks. So if you enjoyed this, uh, stay tuned and uh, check it out and we will see if I can beat it. So thank you guys for watching. I do appreciate it, and I hope to see y'all next time.
So I've got a piece of elm on the lathe today, or at least I'm 75% certain this is elm. I mean, there's a slight chance it could be hickory or pecan, but I'm almost certain this is elm, but that's besides the point. The whole reason why I have this wood chucked up on the lathe today is because of this split right here that runs right through the middle of the wood. Now, I've been wanting to do some more artistic pieces lately, and you know, in the past I've seen people where they take pieces like this where it's got a big void or split or crack in it, and they take you know leather or cord or wire or whatever it may be like that, and they stitch whatever the void may be, and they kind of do like a cross-stitching effect to it. And I thought that's a really kind of a cool effect and I've actually personally never done it. So I thought this wood would make a perfect trial on that because it's got this natural void right down the middle of it. But with that said, let me grab my mask so we can get this thing shaped. All right, so the outside is finished and that went very smoothly. I decided on the last minute there to add this little beaded detail. I actually had a miscut there and it kind of resembled the way a bead would look. And I thought, hey, I like the way that looks. So I decided to turn one in and I'm glad I did. Uh, the voids also ended up being high up enough to where it doesn't affect the tenon down here so when it comes to hollowing it should go just fine and also a little bit bonus uh on the two sides here there is this recess here where the tree just kind of curved in a little deeper than the rest and on the other side there is this crack here that was just uh, i mean it's a pretty big crack and it's going to sound cheesy but this piece is sort of about these these cracks and these voids and imperfections and just making them a part of the piece and making them work for it uh, you know, just showing off the natural state of the wood. Uh, you know, it is sappy, but I do like using these types of defects and imperfections to in almost accentuate the piece in a way. Uh, but yeah, enough blabbing. <laughs> Let me get my mask on and let's flip this thing around so I can get it hollowed out.
All right, so it has been three months since I've turned this bowl and everything is finally ready. It's dry, which has actually been dry for a while, but life kind of getting in the way, but that's the value here nor there. Everything's ready to go. It is ready to be finished. I have my cord here. I decided to go with the leather cord. I thought between the contrast of the brown leather and the lightness of this wood with little hints of brown, I thought that would look really pretty together. And I thought just, you know, black or something like that would have been too harsh of a contrast, but I think this nice subtle brown would look really pretty with this. So my thought process though with whole this, since I've never done this before, is I want to get the bowl completely finished, uh, or at least up until 220 grit on both the inside and outside. Then what I'll do is I'll go through and plan where I'm going to drill the holes for the leather stitching and then drill the holes and then do the final sanding with 320 just in case there's any scratches I need to get out. Once I do that, I'll oil it first and then we will put the leather stitching in once it's all said and done. And I, I just think that would be the smartest way to do it or at least keep the stitching to the last uh, just in case anything happens that I need to sand the bowl anymore. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. I'm, I'm really, you know, playing this by ear, just seeing what happens. Uh, but yeah, let me get my mask on so we can get this bowl finally finished. All right, so the bowl is sanded up to 220 and the next step of the process is to lay out the design and how I want the stitches to look along the cracks here. So I cut out these little templates from the cord that I'll be using. So what I'm gonna do is play around with these little stitches a little bit more and figure out a layout that I wanna do. And I do know I want to keep it kind of minimal and simple because I don't wanna take away from this wood. Uh, I really want to keep the focus on the bowl and not so much the stitches. So I will not be going all the way down the cracks. I'll just be keeping it very small and simple. Uh, just a nice little added detail. But yeah, so let me get these laid out. And once I do that, I'll check back in. All right, so I figured out how I want to lay everything out and I decided to go with three stitches just straight across, no crisscrossing or anything like that. Uh, after playing around with it, the three just straight across looks the cleanest, I think looks the nicest. And also when it comes to this sort of design aspect, I like to keep things at odd numbers. Uh, so that way your eye is drawn to the center and there's a point of attention there, I guess if that's the right way to put it. Anyways, I just think odd numbers when it comes to laying out something like this is just a cleaner look. Uh, but yeah, and also if you wanna get symbolic with it, there's three cracks in this bowl that'll need stitching. And so three stitches are being used. <laughs> but anyways, let me get the drill so I can get these holes uh, drilled out and then I can turn this tenon off.
right, so the bowl is almost done. The only thing that I have left to do is to cut the cord for the cracks here, sign the bottom, and then we can get some oil on this thing. However, I do want to do a dry fit, I guess, of the stitches because I'm really curious to see what it's going to look like. Because like I said, I'm not going to fix the stitches in until the piece is oiled, but I just want to know what it's going to look like. So let me get that done so we can finally call this piece finished. So when I turn a wood bowl, I typically tend to use green wood 95% of the time. And that's simply because it's a lot easier to turn and get a hold of. And it's also cheaper in the long run. But because of that, I actually have to wait a few weeks, a few months, and potentially a few years just for the wood to dry. And that means I don't have a finished piece until it is done drying. But today, I want to try something that I've actually never done before. And that is to take this chunk of maple here and turn it into a finished bowl in 24 hours.
All right, so I've got this beautiful piece of spalted maple mounted on a lathe and ready to go. And like I said, the whole goal of today is to take this piece of wood that was in wall form just a few minutes ago and have it as a final bowl, like finishing all 24 hours from when my gouge takes the first cut. Now just two things real quick. The reason why I chose this wood is because it's sort of giving me a head start as far as drying goes. Uh, it's actually been sitting in my driveway for about two to three years now and it's by no means dry it's still pretty wet but it's not like if you were to take a log and turn it that was just cut down like two or three days ago and even a few weeks like right now I have a few pieces of oak that are in the yard and when I turn those I mean I have water spraying off of those things but I don't think that'll be the case with this so you know it's still wet but I don't think it will be that bad and second, the reason why I decided to go with a natural edge bowl is because when I actually cut into it, there was a pretty bad crack that ran through the pith and it has some cracks branching out from that. But there's nothing terribly, you know, bad about the edge here. There are a few little cracks here and there, but it's nothing that I can't take care of with, with some CA glue. So that's the whole reason because initially I did want to do a traditional style bowl with, you know, the flat top and everything, but that crack sort of changed plans. But uh, I'm excited to see how this piece turns out. So with that said, let me get a mask on so we can get the outside shaped. So the outside is about finished. I just have two things left to do. And for one, that's to clean up the tenon. And I had actually already started that when I was roughing out the blank, but I need to do a little bit more finessing with it to get it finished. And then two, I decided to be a little bit extra with this piece and actually add some feet to it. Now I haven't done that since the oak bowl that I turned a few months ago, I believe. And the, the carved feet are honestly one of my favorite little details to add to a bowl. And I'm already turning the bowl in 24 hours, so I figured why not add a little bit extra to do on top of this. Uh, but yeah, uh, everything is turning out wonderfully. This bowl or this wood is beautiful. I absolutely love the way it looks. And I believe I'm going to go in and do a little bit of sanding, maybe just 80 grit. But the actual final sanding I'll do like I normally do when I actually like use a jam chuck and everything. But I might go in and start cleaning up these tool marks just because. But Anyways, let me get my mask back on so we can get all these things done and flip this thing around.
right, so the bowl is almost finished. Uh, the turning portion is done except for cleaning up the tenon, but what I plan to do next is to try and sand as much as I can. And I think I'm gonna to go to 220 and then kind of let the surface moisture evaporate and then come back with 320 and do my final sanding. And that will be both for the inside and the outside. However, I will go in and do the outside sanding and then do the final sanding when I can jam chuck it and turn the tenon off. Uh, but yeah, I'm really excited about this bowl. I'm excited for the oiling shots. And speaking of that, I don't think I'm actually oil today. I think I'm gonna get in the shop early in the morning and do that and just kind of let this sit and air out overnight. Uh, just see if anything happens, if anything needs to be fixed, because there are a few cracks here at the top that need some CA glue. However, that's not from you know, like drying right now. That is from just sitting in the driveway in the sun and the heat for three years. So I'm gonna fill those in. But yeah, since I'm kind of on a time crunch, let me stop talking, get my respirator on, and get this thing sanded. Everybody. It is just a little past seven here in the shop and I wanted just to kind of come out here and make sure the bowl survived the night and what I mean is that there was no cracks or checks that came out throughout the night and luckily everything survived nothing happened the bowl is just as I left it yesterday afternoon but the next step is just to get some oil on it so at least it's dry to the touch by 1 p.m. this afternoon uh, but yeah let me get ready and do that but first I'm gonna drink some coffee
the bowl is finished and I beat the time limit just right around two hours. And truthfully, I had a ton of fun doing this and it's something I definitely plan to try again in the future because this piece of maple was not the only piece of wood that I've had sitting in my driveway for years, which is kind of sad to say as a wood turner, but it is what it is. There will be a, few, or a video like this in the future. But that's going to be it for this one. And if y'all enjoyed this, please let me know in the comments. I always do appreciate that. And here are the final shots of what I'm calling the 24-hour uh, the bowl. Alright, so I have something new I want to try today, and it's something I've been wanting to do for quite a while now. And whether you're new or have been following, if you see any of my past videos, you'll see that I do a lot of bowl turning and just wood turning in general. Now when I do bowls, I specifically work from logs, aka green wood. But because of that, I actually have quite a log collection laying around my yard. Now when I got started in woodworking, I actually started in shop class back in high school doing furniture. And here lately I've had an itch to want to get back into doing some furniture. So with those logs laying around and a decent chainsaw, I actually use a 462, a steel, I've been wanting to try slabbing up my own slabs. <laughs> so the goal today is to give that a shot. Now I've never done that before. This is my first time ever doing it. So this is not a how-to. This is more of an observation. Watching me give this a shot. So let me get everything together, get this ready, and let's see if we can uh, get some slabs. Alright, so this is the setup I decided to go with for my very first time chainsaw milling. Now for the mill, I found this one on Amazon and I believe it's called the Zozen brand. It had pretty good reviews and it ran me around $90. So I'm really curious to see how it will do. And from what I've read, it actually is a pretty good meal for, you know, for not so much of an investment compared to something more expensive. But I did decide to spend money where I figured it would count and that's in the bar and chain. So I decided to go with 30 inch bar and ripping chain from Grand Bird, which ran me around $150. Believe it was 30 to 45 for the chain and 80 to $90 for the bar. So I'm excited to see how that works because I've actually never used a ripping chain even when ripping out bowl blanks from logs. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that'll do in this haul. And then I decided to go with some brackets, a two by four ladder setup across the top. And then for the end grain ceiling, I went with the tried and true anchor seal, which you just can't beat that. That's what they're known for. So that's what I'll be using to, uh, to try to stop the cracking. <laughs> so let me get the mill and the saw, get this thing set up, and let's get some cutting done.
So that seems to be it. it wasn't that difficult, but it was tedious. Uh, the instructions are okay. They're not the best, but they could be worse. It took, I think, around 30 or so minutes to get this thing together. But yeah, everything looks good. So let me get the board running across the top of the log so I can set the depth and we'll get to cutting. So I finally got everything set up and it's all ready to go. I ended up wanting to saw this maple here. It's about three and a half feet long, 18 inches at its widest, maybe 20. And it's got some really pretty spotting that seems to run throughout the woods. So I'm very curious about this. But uh, I figured something this small would be good to start with. But anyways, let me get the saw started up and uh, we'll see how it goes. Alright, so I'm finally about to start my last cut and so far everything has gone fantastic. I really cannot complain. It has taken a little bit of getting used to with the bar and how the chain pulls and stuff like that. But overall, I'm, I'm thrilled. The slides are beautiful. The cuts are coming out nice and, you know, pretty clean as far as the chainsaw cut goes. So no complaints at all. And uh, I just know I'm really excited and now I'm ready to cut up more boards. But anyways, it's, it's been a long and hot day, so let me get this thing fired back up, get this last cut done, and uh, call it a day.
Well, the slides have been cut, they're sealed and stacked, and they are currently drying, and we're just playing the waiting game for that. Now, those slabs are currently sitting around 25 to 30 percent moisture, so it might be a while. And usually, the rule of thumb for air drying lumber is one year per inch. And hopefully, I might build a little kiln to help speed up that process. But that's for a future video. So, two things I would take away as a first time user for the chainsaw mill, and this is just something I want to share with anybody who else has an interest in potentially using one. First, I would invest in a very good ripping chain. Now, I went with the Grand Berg 30 inch ripping chain, and besides the saw, that thing was the workhorse behind this whole process. I was able to get five slabs out of that log, and I did not have to stop and sharpen once. Now, granted, it wouldn't have hurt if I did sharpen. But I wanted to see just how many cuts I could get without having to do that and it did the whole log without needing to. Every cut was nice and clean. Second, I would create these little story blocks or depth blocks um, that I was using to put under my rails here. Instead of having to manually level out each side, I would put them under, set the rails down on top and then just tighten up so that way I was guaranteed a, you know, a level cut throughout the whole process. And that made life 10 times easier. So those are two things I would recommend. And again, take what I say with a grain of salt because this was just my first time and I am still learning. But those two things did make life and the whole process easier. Also, I want to give a huge shout out to everybody who's been watching my videos and subscribing. I recently crossed 2,000 subscribers, which to me is a huge deal. It took me almost a year to reach 1,000 and then roughly six months to reach two, which is crazy to me. And I'm really excited about how this channel is growing and the direction it's heading in. So if you enjoy this kind of content, please let me know. I would love to hear some feedback and what you think. But anyways, again, I appreciate y'all checking out this video and I hope to see y'all next time.